Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our September Navigating Drought webinar series, or webinar, part of our Navigating Drought webinar series. And we're here at the Carrington Research Extension Center, and I'm joined by... Zach Carlson. I'm the Extension Beef Cattle Specialist located in Fargo. I'm Kevin Sedovic. I'm the NDSU Extension Rangeland Management Specialist located in Fargo and Central Grasslands Research Extension Center. And online we have Adnan Akus. Adnan Akus, North Dakota State Climatologist, and uh, I am joining you from uh, NDSU in Fargo. And then we also have Carl Hoppe. Hi, I'm Carl Hoppe, Extension Livestock Specialist here at the Carrington Research Extension Center. And just joining us, we have Sean Brotherson. Uh, Sean Brotherson, Family Science Specialist with NDSU Extension and uh, involved with um, a lot of issues related to farm stress and mental health and wellness in agriculture. And I'm Miranda Meehan, the Livestock Environmental Stewardship Specialist, as well as our Disaster Education Coordinator with NDSU Extension. So just a few housekeeping things. If you haven't joined our, one of our webinars in the past, this will be recorded. It will be available on our drought website. If you, go, if you look up NDSU Extension Drought, you should be able to find that. And if you can't, let us know and we'll help you find it later. Um, that'll be available in a day or two usually. And then um, the script for today was based off of your guys' questions. So we really wanna say thank you for everybody that registered and, the, and submitted questions. If you do have a question come up as, as we go through our webinar, type them in and we'll address them as, as we're going through. So we won't wait till the end or hold them to the end. We'll, we'll address them with that topic area. As we know, most of the state continues to be in drought, um, almost 100%, just a little bit under, um, just in the southeast corner there. And we're gonna turn it over and start with a drought update and, and a an, uh, climate outlook from Adnan, and then we'll move into our discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Adnan Akius. Uh, you should be seeing my slide. First one is saying that this is the drought update and my information is there. And we're gonna start uh, right into the drought monitor that was published this morning at 8 a.m. Uh, you are looking at the biggest change in North Dakota is the Northeast portions of the state got into extreme drought conditions. And as you know, we have just uh, improved uh, the central North Dakota where uh, the Sheridan County and McBean County were under D4. Uh, and D4 were in the area for 18 straight uh, the weeks in a row since uh, the May 18 to September 19. So that broke uh, a longevity record too. Uh, just like Miranda said, uh, the entire, almost entire North Dakota, 99.6% of the state or 669 plus thousand people in drought. Uh, and, and we are still hanging on to that D4 or exceptional drought in uh, the Western portions of the state, hanging over from the, uh, the Montana area just a little sliver in Golden Valley County, uh, and that is a 0.5%. And 59% of the state is still under extreme drought or worse in North Dakota. Next slide is going to tell us uh, the conditions uh, since 30 days ago. And uh, we had some precipitation yesterday, especially in the southeastern portion of the state where it is not much needed really. Uh, we need the precipitation in the northwestern portions of the state. So you need to add that amount, uh, about 0.45% uh, fell near Wapaton areas. And as you're looking at the uh, past 30 day period from uh, uh, at the end of um, August to September, a uh, meager amount of precipitation in the northwestern portions of the state. If you're looking at the percent, uh, you need to pay attention to the map to the right hand side. Uh, it is between 20 to 30 percent uh, of the precipitation that normally falls in the 30-day period. Next slides are going to show us on the left-hand side, the map is for the 60-day percent of normal and 90-day percent of the normal to the right. And you're still looking at the, uh, the much drier uh, the condition to the northwestern portion of the state that justifies the amount of increase in the D3 or extreme drought conditions in that area. Uh, even though the drought might not be as bad as when we started uh, in the beginning of the season in May 18, 
which reached to the highest extent, uh, it still is the drought severity and coverage index is 351, still is the greatest, uh, and it even beats the 2017 and 2006. And those are the two other years D4 was introduced in North Dakota. Uh, looking at the uh, much extended periods, uh, and the previous slide took us back to 2000. This is when the drought monitor started um, implementing drought monitor maps. But if I use the standardized precipitation index for the six months of period, so how it is calculated is that you take the average pre precipitation uh, and then subtract the normal precipitation from there. If the average is greater than normal, that would be a positive that would put all these uh, above zero numbers. And when we look at that during the past uh, months in August, based on the SPI numbers, and here are the rankings, 1936 was the worst drought, 1988 was the fourth, and 2021 was the 10th, uh, the worst drought on record. And when we look at the, uh, the July 1936, 1988, 2021 was still there, but moving into the past, then really drought was really worse during the, the earlier uh, the periods in this season. For example, SPI in April, 2021 was number one. In other words, it was the worst drought ever since 1895, and that was even worse than 1988 and 1936. March and February, it was the same. So. The drought was really worse during the earlier times, even though the precipitation may um, eliminated some of the, the worst drought conditions, but still suffering from that earlier, uh, the big drought. And if you notice that it has been very warm around yourself and, and you're, you're not along, uh, it, it's been the record breaking warm temperatures. For example, uh, for Fargo, I took Fargo and Bismarck for an example. Uh, these are the rankings of the temperature in July through September. Uh, so based on the 127 years of record, uh, it has been the warmest such period on record. And guess what? The second warmest is 1988 and the third uh, warmest was 1936. So we are gonna see these years coming along with this year back to back, which makes me think that the 1988 and 1936 were very similar conditions. Bismarck, uh, it still is the warmest period on record. Second warmest is 1936, and the sixth warmest was 1988. Looking at the 90 degree days, in other words, number of days above 90 degrees. And, and for Fargo, uh, the number one was 1936, 1988, and number three is 1921 with the 31 such days uh, this year. But looking at Bismarck, look at these uh, data. 50, 90 degree days this year, which breaks the record. It is number one, 2021. Second highest number is 1936. And the third highest number is 1988. So no matter how you look at it, you are gonna see that 1988 and 1936 in the picture. Uh, and, and main reason for that is dry soil. Looking at the, uh, the NASA GRACE uh, soil moisture model on the left-hand side, it is the shallow layer. On the right-hand side, it is the uh, root zone to one meter. And all these dark brown areas are indicating the driest in the period on record. No sweatshirt portions of the state, even in the surface, but the deep soil uh, has been very warm. When the solar radiation is received in that soil, uh, every portion of that solar radiation is utilized to warm the atmosphere rather than evaporating the, the moisture that the soil may have. Looking at the outlooks during the next seven day on the left-hand side, the precipitation. And unfortunately not much precipitation is promised during the next seven day period into October 7. Uh, much precipitation is in the Southeastern portions of the state. Temperature wise, all these red colors are indicating it is going to be a warm, much warmer than normal seven day period. Looking into the, the next seven day period after that. So that period is going to cover October 7 through 13. Uh, precipitation wise, the model has some reason to add that about normal precipitation to the Western North Dakota. So this is a great news. This is the best news I have heard since uh, about two weeks ago. Temperature wise, uh, warmer than normal conditions, unfortunately continues. 
during the next seven day period from October 7 through 13. Week three and four, this is gonna take us all the way into October 22nd. Map on the right hand side is indicating the precipitation and brown color is indicating there's a greater chance of having drier than normal. But again, the temperature, uh, it is no brainer. Uh, continue to be warmer than, much warmer than normal conditions. In fact, uh, the model has the, the highest skill with 80% chance of having above normal precipitation in Eastern portions of the state. Looking a little further into a one month period, October. Unfortunately, this map uh, forecast hasn't been updated since September 16. Map on the right hand side is showing uh, the old forecast and this is null, no longer acceptable because uh, based on the forecast that we saw earlier, drier than normal conditions are going to take place during October. And, and again, the warmer than normal conditions in the, uh, uh, the temperature wise. Looking further into October through December, equal chance. So the model has no uh, skill to break the tie between above, below or near normal. And temperature wise, it is equal chance too. Looking at December through February, this is winter forecast. And unfortunately, climate forecast, uh, the center uh, is no good for us. So what I wanted to do is uh, uh, get into the ENSO or El Nino and Southern Oscillation to make some kind of forecast. Uh, uh, the, the numbers in the negative are indicating La Nina conditions and, and all these lines are indicating different models for ENSO or El Nino conditions. And all of these lines are uh, under the zero line, indicating that there is a greater chance for La Nina conditions to persist into the winter. When it is La Nina, it is uh, wetter and cooler than normal conditions in the uh, North Dakota area. Uh, however, uh, last year was La Nina too, but it, it was nothing uh, like that in, in the last year's winter. But this year we are looking at the uh, unusually warm sea surface temperature just to the east in Atlantic Ocean. When the subtropical high uh, indicated this blue line is moving southward with the sun uh, in the winter time, it is going to be able to push more moisture that is going to be readily available into the atmosphere by uh, easy evaporation. And knowing that the, uh, the conditions in Colorado is improving, so I have a better chance of having weather than normal condition this winter. Another way to look at it is, as you saw in the earlier, uh, the graphics, 1988 was very similar. And luckily, 1988-89 winter was a La Nina year too. However, you have to keep in mind, this is a strong La Nina. And, and good news is that in 1988-89 winter and 89 spring, we can use it as a proxy or analog for forecast what might be coming up. 1988-89 winter was the 24th wettest and 62nd coldest. And the spring of the same year was the 54th driest, but still is not one of the driest. So there is a, a delight and at the end of the tunnel. So that was my last slide. Let me unshare my screen to pass the word back to the uh, drought central. Thanks, Adnan. For Dr. Uh, Sean Hunnison, um, you know, the drought has placed increased stress on our farm and ranch communities. What resources are available to help farm and ranch families manage the stress? That's a great question, Kevin. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I have a few slides I can share if, if you'd like me to do so. I don't know if that's enabled or not, Miranda, but, but if not, I can just talk through some basic things. One of the, the things that Extension across the region has done is to try and pull together resources and make them available uh, in a variety of, of settings, particularly online. And so I, I would note that um, the, the regional website um, for farm stress resources is just called the farm, I mean, the North Central Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Center. And so uh, that can be found easily online. And the nice thing about that is it has available um, resource materials, not only from NDSU Extension, but also from all of the extension programs and land grant university systems across the upper Midwest, uh, including 
South Dakota, Iowa, Minnesota, um, Missouri, and other other states in the region who have also uh, similarly been experiencing many of the agricultural conditions that we've experienced here in North Dakota. So I would encourage people uh, to take advantage of the resources there at the North Central Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Center online, um, which also links to a lot of our NDSU resources. Um, on the NDSU Ag Hub page, which has been linked in the chat, um, uh, we have a web page specifically under farm management uh, that focuses on managing stress. And there you can access educational publications, uh, short educational videos, and links to a variety of organizations that provide uh, resources relative to mental health and wellness in agriculture. I would note specifically that there's uh, resources for suicide prevention, uh, referral for services, just uh, simply if you're looking, say, for a counselor or something like that, um, there are links on there. Um, Together Counseling is a partner uh, in the region um, that we are partnered with in North Dakota um, that offers farm-to-farm -farm counseling. That means um, telehealth services, so you can be in the cab of your pickup truck or at your kitchen table, and you can talk with a counselor who um, also has a background in agriculture and understand some of the dynamics of stress that you may be experiencing. And so um, whether you are um, a farmer or whether you are uh, working in an area that you support agriculture, being aware of that resource I think is, is very helpful. One of the nice things about that is that we have funding support. So if um, there would be any kind of financial obstacle to participating uh, in a counseling experience. Um, we have funding support to um, cover the costs uh, associated with that. And so um, that should not be a barrier um, through the services that Together Counseling provides. So I would just emphasize uh, that particular variety of, of resources that are available. I'd also mention, of course, that the um, State Department of Agriculture has a lot of resources that are specific um, to a variety of particular needs. If you're dealing with um, uh, specific financial concerns and you need mediation with a lender, of course, there's ag mediation. Um, if, if you're uh, needing assistance with um, specific operations on, on your farm or ranch operation, um, uh, both our drought website and the State Department of Agriculture uh, have links to specific programs that you can utilize. So I'd encourage people to use the resources that are needful for their specific circumstances. Uh, and, um, and just encourage people to um, take a little time uh, and, and acquaint themselves with those resources that can be helpful in managing their stress and in improving their health and wellness. Thanks for sharing, Sean. Switching gears a little bit, Kevin, uh, we've been getting lots of questions on drought impacts to grazing lands. Um, many pastures have been subject to overuse this year. How does this impact grassland species and how long will it take for them to recover? Thanks, Zach. You know, overgrazing is probably, is really our most negative impact on our grasslands in terms of forage production and plant species composition. And, it, and the beauty of the Northern Plains is they're very resilient so they can take these one-time overuse events. Um, with two years of really a drought, and we've seen overgrazing occur in 2020, we're seeing it now in 2021, um, these longer term overgrazing do impact plant vigor. And in response, that lack of plant vigor does impact forage production. And so with this drought, especially if it continues on, we're gonna see this negative impact on forage production, as well as plant species composition. As we get later in the season, this month of September, October, this is really the critical time period when our grasses are trying to prepare to go in the winter. And that bottom tiller is really gonna be the first plant growth in 2022. So if we can have anything go on out of, the, out of these, these webinars is if we can see producers reduce that grazing pressure in the fall. So those grasses can have a recovery period. Um, we'll see some, some positive impacts on this if we get back to a normal uh, moisture pattern in 2022. Switching gears now, Miranda, or, or kind of more talking about recent rains that we've been having um, have resulted in some late season growth on these pastures and rangelands. Should ranchers take advantage of this fall growth or how should they? 
Yeah, so that really comes down to what species do we have and knowing what species you have out there in the pasture um, and what are the key species of so if we have what plants we see immediately responding are things like Kentucky bluegrass and our smooth brown grass. Those introduce cool season grasses that typically have a fall green up anyways. And so the timing of our rains earlier this month and last night we got some in parts of the state as well. That's really benefited those plants. Our native cool seasons, we want to be careful. We may be able to utilize them, but we really want to be, make sure they're able to recover. Also right now they're putting up their tiller and that tiller is what they're going to initiate growth from next year. So if we graze too heavy and, and we damage that tiller, we're going to delay growth um, and development next year. And we could see even greater impacts to forage production beyond the overgrazing that's already occurred and those impacts. So we want to be careful and make sure that our plants are able to recover. We have seen um, some natives that have had a really good green up and those natives were great, had, were part of a grazing management system that has rest and recovery in it. And they were grazed at the time that they were able at appropriate time. So they were able to capitalize on that fall moisture and grow a little bit more. But we, we wanna be cautious when we're using those to not graze them too hard and damage that tiller. So then Kevin, uh, what are the impacts or what impacts will the drought have looking at 2022's grazing season? And what management practices should we consider as, as uh, producers prepare for that? So the, the, the beauty of this year is we've seen some positive responses in terms of moisture. And so, but we have this caveat in the Western part of the state is still pretty dry. So this 2021 drought, um, if it still occurs like we see in the Western part of the state, uh, th those pastures will really have a negative impact going into next year because they didn't get a chance to recover some of those root, those root carbohydrates. For those of us who have gotten the moisture, if we can at least minimize that overgrazing or reduce the overgrazing this fall, I think we'll see some positive response in 2022 in terms of tiller development. And so it really comes down to management this year. And for next year, if we do maintain the moisture, I think our producers are still gonna see a delay in production. I think we're gonna see a delay in turnout because of the stress we put on the pastures. But where we got the moisture this fall, it won't be quite as bad as those in the Western part of the state where they really didn't get much moisture through this time of period. And then once you get this, you look at these systems, I think it's important for producers to look long-term and really look at some grazing strategies they can do to implement on their land to create natural resiliency on their land base to really handle these drought periods. Um, Miranda, do you have anything to add there? I think the one thing we want to keep in mind is that stocking rate and the importance of making early, early decisions there and timely decisions and not getting over anxious or to restock until we know what 2022 is going to look like. Because that's really one of our basic management that concepts that it really impacts everything within our rangeland systems. And if our stocking rate's not correct and we have overuse on those, those, those pastures and rangeland, we're really going to see some long term impacts. Um, as we, things that we can look at is how can we delay, you know, that to get that recovery, Kevin's talking about, how can we delay turnout next spring um, and make sure that those plants have reached grazing readiness and can, and are ready for that stress of, of grazing and, and can recover from grazing when we do have animals out there. So continue on Miranda, you know, one factor that influences ranchers ability to effectively utilize grazing resources is water. You've been working with extension agents really for the last six months on monitoring water quality. What are your current findings or things that you're seeing in our water systems? Yeah, I know we had a lot of people that were hopeful that with the September rains that we received that water quality would improve. And if you got a lot of rain, it did a little bit, but overall water quality is still a major issue. Um, I know some county agents that were doing monthly monitoring of sources, their sources that they were monitoring are all dried up. And so it's really highly variable depending where you're at in the state. And so we really just encouraging to continue monitoring that. Um, so you know the risks there. So what, to continue on with that, you know, those thoughts, what recommendations do you have for ranchers as they prepare for 2022 grazing season when it comes to livestock water? 
So it really, what's going to happen there is going to depend a lot on how much runoff we have and how much rain we receive in the, in the spring. So to dilute those salts and those water sources. I really encourage just for 2022 beyond to increase your drought resilience is to look into some of the programs that we have available through the state um, right, or, and at the federal level as well. Um, so some of the ones that we automatically think of um, are those cost share programs that are always around, um, whether that's the NRCS equip program or you know, it's a program through, I know our state game of fish has a really good program called Save, Save Our Lakes, um, as well as Ducks Unlimited has some programs too. Uh, some that are specifically related, related to drought as we do have a few counties in North Dakota, I'm sure other states do too that that FSA has the Emergency Conservation Program, ECP. And so there was a few states that had signed up for that that was allowed people to put in water sources that if they were had waters that were either dried up or had poor quality due to drought. And then at the state level here, our Department of Water Resources has a program called the Livestock Disaster Water Supply Project Program. So taking advantage of those dollars and using that to enhance your drought resilience, I think is a really good strategy to use if you can. So now we're gonna shift gears a little bit. Um, and as we move into fall, we may, we see many producers are, are grazing, will be grazing or, and have started in some cases, some corn stover and other crop residues, um, Zach, and we've been hearing reports of corn that's failed to produce years in some parts of the state. How does this influence the quality of our corn stover and what adjustments should be made in those cases? Yeah, so with grazing corn residue or other crop residues, certainly grain uh, is something we want to note, uh, especially if there's piles of grain after, after harvesting that field to avoid those, of course. Uh, grain overload is an issue, especially when we have downed ears of corn, uh, when that does happen. However, in this case, if we're dealing uh, kind of on the opposite end of that with uh, fewer ears of corn, or if we're looking at grazing standing corn, which is something uh, that may be happening this year, those are some considerations to take into account. So with grazing standing corn, you want to step those cattle. But uh, when it comes to evaluating corn, whether that's looking at grazing standing corn fields or following corn harvest and grazing corn residue, those are kind of two different things. So standing, uh, grazing standing corn, you want to make sure you're limiting access um, in that field to your animals. And then um, 10 days, 14 days prior to uh, going out in that standing corn, you're stepping those cattle up, starting with a couple pounds per head and moving your way up to five, six, seven pounds, getting them adjusted to that. When we look at grazing corn residue following, um, you know, limited uh, ears in the field isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, we, we don't have as much concern uh, about uh, grain overload or causing some rumen acidosis issues with our animals. And so there will be a little less energy maybe in that field, but still um, a great source for so this issue also influences the quality of silage. What recommendations do you have for those that put corn silage up that had no or poor ear development? Sure, I'd love to talk about corn silage this year. Um, we've got a lot of different things going out there in the fields. Uh, anywhere from grain corn that uh, was harvested uh, that didn't produce much to silage corn that uh, is long day and had poor germinations and of course some of these corns just didn't even produce a cob and it, it all makes things different. But I'd like to suggest if you chop it, it'll be feed for the cow herd this winter. Uh, when you go to sample, when you go to feed the silage, be sure to sample it so you can identify what type of crude protein, dry matter, uh, energy content there is in the feed. Even though there isn't ears or corn starch in the silage, there's still a lot of sugar still left in the stalk if it's green. So with that in mind, uh, you may not be disappointed with the quality of the feed that you have in your corn silage pile this year. One thing you should watch out for is, is uh, moisture content. The grain corns are drying down rather rapidly. The corn silage varieties may not have dried down. You expect it's fall, it's going to freeze, but it hasn't. So some of our short corn silages, uh, excuse me, some of our short corns that are silage varieties they appear to be hanging on to their moisture quite well. So in other words, you might have some really high moisture corn silage and uh, those piles might seep. So watch for that. 
Um, you know, you want to have moisture in your corn silage pile to make good fermentation. And 65 to 67 would be the holy grail, the best time to have moisture content in your pile. But we can get over 70 and then it'll start leaking. If we're less than 60, then of course, not as good of fermentation. So really watch the moisture content. We didn't talk about this yet, but I don't think, but nitrates is a consideration when you're looking at your silage quality this year. Um, usually the fermentation process will take care of it, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to test your feed for nitrates along with the crude protein, which might be higher this year because uh, um, it, some of the tests I've seen so far have been high in crude protein compared to other years and in corn silage. So see what that might show up to be. Um, one comment about corn silage, even poor quality corn silage makes a really good supplement to poor quality hay. Because poor quality silage is, and I mean by poor quality, I mean lower energy containing silage, still provides a lot of nutrients to dress up some poor quality hay that was harvested or straw that was harvested this year. So even though we like to put up really good quality stuff, just remember that balance your ration. You'll be surprised how well cows will continue and blend and the ration will blend with that to make a better quality feed. Like I said earlier, um, the crude protein, digestible fiber, might be, you'll be surprised how good it is, even with this short stunted feed that doesn't have an ear on it. So be sure to feed test to find out what you have, but by all means, please put up the silage for feed. So Zach, some producers were able to successfully establish a cover crop, um, especially if you're a patient. I know we had some that we thought failed and with the recent rains, they took off and were able to utilize those. Um, and so what do we, what toxicity concerns are, what should we be thinking about, especially this drought stress cover crops when we're grazing those? Yeah, um, considerations, if you go back and, and look at, you know, go back and watch our series videos, you'll see we talk a lot about nitrates and that's certainly been an issue uh, this year throughout the drought. Anytime that plant is stressed, we're dealing with uh, potential uh, a nitrate accumulation in some varieties, particularly uh, for nitrates and cover crops, we're going to be looking at our, our um, annual cereals, so our, our rye, wheat, um, triticale, and oats particularly, as well as our brassicas will be accumulators. And so nitrates are certainly something to be aware of when we're, when we're out grazing. Uh, so I, I highly encourage everyone uh, looking at grazing cover crops or starting to, to make sure you reach out to your county agent and get those uh, cover crops tested for nitrates. They can help you uh, with uh, collection as well as submission of that sample. The other one to consider, is, and I think most of us are familiar with, are uh, prussic acid or cyanide gases. Um, those could be contained within usually the sedan grass sorghum and sedan grass sorghum hybrids. Those are the particular focus for those um, plant species. And uh, especially now when we're talking about, we know a, a frost is coming, uh, though we haven't had many up to this point, but uh, so at that time, that's really when the, you get a little bit disruption within that plant cell and you end up releasing some of that cyanide gas. And so uh, be sure uh, to be watching if you have animals out currently grazing uh, and be prepared and have a plan when you see these hard frosts, if particularly if uh, those species I mentioned are a majority or a larger portion of your cover crop, be prepared and, and, uh, and see the frost coming and be able to, to move those animals off and give it a few days before bringing those animals back in onto that cover crop. Uh, the last one that I'll mention is um, one that we don't hear about much, uh, but should be on everyone's radar, uh, particularly this year. So Fog fever um, is, is it's uh, known is a respiratory tract uh, disease that occurs when animals essentially move from a lower protein uh, grazing uh, or even in a feeding system, lower protein feed diet into a higher, such as a cover crop. So when we talk about moving from um, eight or so protein up into the mid to upper teens in protein levels, um, that can actually cause uh, fog fever. And um, you should watch for this within the first two weeks of turning out onto cover crop. There isn't much of a treatment. It will appear as though it's a, a pneumonia, but you cannot treat it through antibiotics because it's not viral nor is it bacterial. 
And so uh, the caution there is to have good uh, grazing practices. And by that, I mean turning cattle out that are full and not hungry. So fill them up uh, days prior on feed and then monitor. And as much as it may be a nuisance, keep a close eye on animals for their breathing uh, behaviors and track that. And then um, if you do start to notice something, the best situation there is to move your cattle off that field. Let them, um, give them a couple days and to let that, uh, basically the, the metabolite that's running through the blood system kind of run its course. And then at that time, uh, you can resume grazing. All right. Well, Kevin, kind of on the same tone, how can producers safely graze those, these resources? So if you have anything to add to that, but then also what, while reducing feed waste with a drought, we wanna maximize what's out there. And so how can we do that in these type of systems? So I think Zach really made a good point on these cover crop mixes tend to be really high in quality in terms of protein value. They also tend to be very high in water. And so we tested some cover crops this year that are running close to 80% water. And so one thing you can do to reduce that, that um, improve the rumination process with fiber is add some fiber to the diet. And so what we've been doing in a lot of our trials is we will add a, a free choice hay or a free choice straw bale, something that they will consume with the high water content of these cover crops to reduce passage, slow down passage. And it's amazing how cows will really select for that hay that's in that field. Even though they've got all this lush vegetation available to them, they will pick and they'll go and graze those, those bales. We've been using rye, surprisingly, and they ate quite a bit of the rye to slow down that passage. And it's really trying to balance their diet so they get a nice mix of fiber in their diet as well as high quality feed. And it does make it more usable and more efficient when they look at consuming these, these diets. When you're using a cover crop or grazing any kind of, of crop that you could see um, some trampling effect, the best way is to improve efficiency is through strip grazing. And so what we tend to do is, is put a hot wire up and allow about five to seven days of grazing. And we tend to move this, this, this fence away from the water source over time to get a more uniform, efficient use of the pasture. And what we've seen in the literature will show you can get about a 30 to 45% increase in harvest efficiency by strip grazing versus giving them free access to the whole field. And so one is add fiber and strip graze to get the most efficiency out of the mix. So those are great questions. And so we're gonna go back to Zach here as, you know, as winter approaches, many producers are concerned about having enough food to get through the winter months. How should a producer go about com completing a feed inventory? The main focus with a feed inventory is, of course, having count. Know what you have in terms of quantity. Once you have counted out your, your resources and you know, and, and, there's, and even if you're dealing with silage, um, to, you, know, you should have an idea of how many tons you brought in based on how many acres you have. And then with bales and so on and so forth, just be counting. Count that out. So we have a, an initial start to uh, the amount we have. But that kind of brings me into the next point of, we know how many we have, now we know how, we have to know how much we have. And so in that case, um, hopefully you were able to, whether you purchased or produced the forage, to have an idea of how heavy your feeds are in terms of weight. Then um, what really we want to account for after that is the moisture content in those feeds, whether that is the si a silage or if it's a dry hay produced. And that is easy to do at home. If you wanted to do a coster test or, or uh, even use a microwave in that sense, but I would encourage producers to look uh, when you submit a sample, which you really should so that you can get nutrient values back, crude protein, energy, fiber content of those feeds, you can also get a dry matter at that point. It's important to account for moisture because moisture, although water of course is needed in animals, we don't need it in that feed and we want to account for it in the feed so that we can get an accurate amount of protein, energy and fiber that is in those feeds so that we can adjust and, and uh, account for that. So it's really important, know how many you have, know how much they weigh and know what water content is in there. And once you have that, it's, it's important to then take a look at the animals that you have uh, that you'll be feeding because those requirements would change. And I encourage you again to go out to and contact your local county agent and they can help you figure out 
the, the energy and protein requirements of your animals based on whatever stage they're in production uh, and, and kind of work through that. So then when, once you know how much you have to have and how much you have available sitting in your lot, then you can start to see kind of pencil out um, how far that, that feed inventory can take you. And then you can start staging different feeds at different periods throughout the winter if you have that uh, access. And uh, maybe one last thing to add would be shrink. Don't forget shrink. So we know there's going to be losses um, through storing of the feeds, and we know there's going to be losses between storage and feeding. Um, and so uh, a good kind of rule of thumb, but it does vary quite a bit, is uh, dry haze and such can be between 10 to 15 percent of their weight as shrink. That's feed that will not go towards the animal is just lost in the process. If you roll your bales out, that may even be more as we know they can tend to make some of that feed into bedding and in situations like that. So account for that and, and, and use, a, use a general rule of thumb between 15 to 20% to help you through that. There's also some resources once you know what you have and what you need. And if it looks as though you're gonna be coming up short, um, what we can look at is the NDSU feed list is a great resource um, for posting available feeds. If you, if you now find out you have maybe a little more than what you need and are able to make some revenue from, from your additional feed resources, or if you need more, uh, you, can, you can post either way. And so those are great resources that are in the chat right now. Additional to that is the North Dakota Department of Agriculture's Hay Hotline. And that's an integrated map that actually allows you to be able to look in your area as well as outside of the state and be able to access both. Again, you can list feed needs or feed available, um, as well as a couple other options. And you can see that when you go onto their website. So I encourage you, once you know what you have, once you have an inventory, to seek those sources for further, for further information. Well, thanks, Zach. You know, we talked about some programs available for finding food feed or for, or for moving feed out. So for Miranda, what programs are available for producers experiencing feed shortages besides those other programs? Yeah, we have a few that are available at both the federal and the state level. I know we visit about this a lot, but if you haven't already, there's a signed up for it. I think a lot of people already have is the FSA LFP program, the Livestock Forage Program, and that's for those shortages that occurred on range and pasture due to the drought. Um, and I know several that that one's been the signups open it's act and it's and they've been actively signing people up and payments are have gone out in some case in several cases. I think almost $24 million have gone out in the state of North Dakota alone to date. Um, another one that was recently announced is that FSA expanded the emergency livestock assistance program or the ELAP program to cover feed transportation costs. What that looks like yet, we don't know. So stay tuned for that. Um, they're still figuring that out at the federal level. But once we know, we'll pass that on to our extension agents and everyone else. Um, at the state level, we also have a depart the Department of Ag has a feed transportation program. And we've gotten some questions. So how will that work with the FSA program? We don't know for sure until we know more details. I think it'll be, the, it'll be similar and people will be able to take advantage of both. Um, it's just that your payment for the federal pro ELAP program will be, would be minus what you receive from the, the Department of Ag, which is, is capped anyways. So um, that's another one and that one um, they're encouraging you to wait until the end of the sign up and save your receipts and turning everything at, in at the end when you know what you have spent or and have anticipated what you're going to spend on feed transportation. Oops. And I think, yeah, right now those are the only feed related ones that are, are going on. Well, I think that kind of wraps up um, our. Uh, our show today. So I want to thank you all for joining us. And I want to thank all the panelists for sharing their information and their thoughts. Please reach out to your local extension agent with any drought related questions, as they can help you uh, uh, specifically for your area and your needs. Join us again, October 28th for the next Navigating Drought webinar, which will focus on winter feeding and nutrition following drought. Mm -hmm.